fellowship. I need your fellowship. I need your brotherhood and your sisterhood. I need you to survive. Don't ever think that you're not important to me. I don't care if I'm having a bad day and we may not see eye to eye on some things. The bottom line is we can disagree, but I still need you. I still want you. And together we will survive because when two or more are gathered in the name of Jesus, there shall he also be. And so I'm telling you how awesome and how wonderful it is here today because I'm here with you. I get a chance to fellowship God with, with you. I get to sit sense and receive God's revelation with you. And hopefully together, as we receive what God has for us, we will be encouraged to serve together and to bring someone else into this fellowship. Amen. Amen. For those persons that have your Bibles, or you have an electronic device with your Bible app on it, would you please turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew? Amen. Praise God. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. And when you have, amen, praise God, when you have uh, the scripture, would you please stand for the reading, excuse me, of the words. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Amen. And you can pray. Matthew 26. And when you have it, would you please stand for the reading of the word? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Reading from the New Living Translation of the Scripture, the Word of God is as follows. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wild flyers, flowers, I'm sorry, that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And the Lord will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Thus far, the word of God, you may be seated. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The title of today's sermon is Exposing the Root Causes of Needless Prayer. Exposing the Root Causes of Needless Prayer. How many people here this morning are brave enough to admit that our best prayers are said during times of duress? That our best prayers, the ones where we really get to the nitty gritty, when we really get down and dirty with God, are those times when we find ourselves in a predicament or a tribulation that looks like, that feels like, it's far above what we can handle or even deal with. Am I the only one here that's brave enough to admit that there are times when I am walking with God and this thing gets to be so heavy, this thing gets to be so hard that what happens, I end up and find myself on my knees begging God to come and help me out. Amen. I see some people. Thank you for your braveness to, to, to admit this morning that there are times when our prayers are as good as gold. And unfortunately, those times our prayers are as good as gold are those times when we're going through it. And when, when the white would almost say, I'm catching the hell, I'm dealing with something, I'm going through it. Now, on the flip side of that, our prayer life tends to ease up when things are all right. 
Come on, tell the truth, Shady yeah. Dove. Yeah, when things are going well, you know, we don't necessarily get our prey on or our praise on like we should. In fact, what happens, we assume that God is doing this because we have earned the blessing. That we've earned the good things that God has given to us. Oh, girl, he, God has brought me a man. He loved me to death. I earned that. You know how many draws I had to kiss in order to find my prince? Oh, my God, I earned that. You know, oh, you know, you, got, you know what? I got hired at the job. You know what? I went down there. I didn't have all the qualifications. But when I walked in, the interviewer said, you know what? You look like the kind of person that will really bless our company. And I got the job. Praise God. And, and, and you move on. And, but the, the funny thing is, long as things are going good, our prayer life seems to slow down. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guilty of it. And I'm the pastor. How many times when it's good, we just get right into bed and go right to sleep? Mm -hmm. Or better yet, we get into bed, we don't even get on knees anymore. We get in the bed, put our head back and go, Dear Father God, thank you for loving me. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even finish out the first sentence of the prayer because it's good to us. And this morning, what we're going to deal with, because we're in our 60 days of prayer, is needless prayer. Okay, now I know I just said the word needless prayer. You heard me say it in the title. I know the good Christians sitting here like, all right, Pastor, where are you going? I can get what you last week. You were talking about prayer and spiritual warfare, but now you have tied the word prayer with needless. How dare you say that prayer is not needed? Well, give God a chance. Don't stone me just yet. After the sermon, if I haven't preached it right, then you may stone me. Amen. Praise Amen. God. But let's give God a chance here this morning. In our scripture, read for us this morning, it's a very familiar scripture. Jesus is, is on his, the sermon, uh, on the mountain, he's giving his sermon on the mountainside, and he, what he's doing, he's reconfiguring Torah. I don't know what Torah is, it's the law that God gave through Moses, uh, and it's, it governs how uh, uh, Israelites were to live, how Jews were to live, and what Jesus is doing in Matthew. He's beginning his ministry by reconfiguring Torah. You see, the problem with Torah is Torah was good, and it was perfect, but the, the problem is Torah dealt with the black and the white areas of life. It, it dealt with the hard and fast areas, those things that we agree, agree on, you know, that, you know, uh, up is up, down is down. But Torah had a problem with the gray areas of life, those areas of life in between the rules, in between the boundaries. You know, you know what I'm talking about. The law said, do not make a right turn on red. You pull up to the red light and you see an old woman crossing the street and she falls down in the middle of the street. Now, you can't keep your car there. You want to help her out, so you make the right turn on red so that you can turn into the parking lot to go help the old woman that fell in the street, but yet here comes a police officer. And the police officer wants to give you a ticket. And the first thing you say is, but officer, didn't I, didn't you see the woman in the street? She fell. I'm trying to help her. That's the only reason why I turned red on, 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 right on red. That was a problem with Torah. Torah had no bend. There was no bending of it. There was no uh, fluidity of it. There was no, 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 no exceptions to the rule. Either you, either you, observed the law or you did it. It didn't care if there were some exceptions. In fact, do you remember uh, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and they asked them, why are you healing on the Sabbath? You see, the law said on the Sabbath no one was to work. It was Sabbath rest. And Jesus said, but wait a second, if all of you have sheep or have animals and one goes astray on the Sabbath, would you not leave the 99 and go find the one? And when you find the one, you are rejoicing because you have brought all the sheep, all the livestock back together. What he's saying is then, yes, the rule is that you should not work on the Sabbath because you should get some rest. However, uh, there's this area, this gray area, where sometimes we have to break the rule in order to live by the will of God. And so Jesus is reconfiguring Torah because as good as Torah it has been meant to be, its execution leaves something to desire. And one of the things that Jesus is dealing with this morning or is dealing with on his Sermon on the Mountain is this thing called worry. Amen. Praise God. How many people here worry? 
Go ahead and tell the truth in the devil. Amen. And how many of us are excessive worriers? Like, hey, man, I'm not, I'm going to look at the door because I know a couple. I might even blink because then on the ride home, I'll be in trouble. Amen. Praise God. From both of my mama and someone else. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Uh, we worry a lot. We worry if we have enough. We worry if we don't have enough. We worry if we're doing it right. We worry if we're doing it wrong. We worry if we're in the right area. We worry if we're in the wrong area. We worry if the television doesn't come on. We worry if the television doesn't go off. We worry if mama doesn't answer the phone on the first ring. We worry while mama won't get off the phone with us. Amen. Amen. Let me make you laugh. This week I had borrowed my mother-in-law's car and uh, to move some things and I went to take her car back and I forgot my car was sitting at her house. So when I come around the corner, I see a black car in my mama's, in my mother-in-law's driveway. I'm like, my man is my mother-in-law's car. Hold on, wait a second. What, what, what boyfriend is she entertaining? Man, you should have seen me speed up to the house and not I got out and I realized that's my car. But I'm like, hey, 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 man, praise God. I was worried that some man had snuck in on us and had stolen my mother-in-law's car. We worried. And many times we worry so much that it prevents us from operating in faith. Amen. We, we worry to the point that we forget that we serve a God that loves us so much that he's going to take care of us, that he's going to provide for us. We worry to the fact, to the point where we don't even give God a chance to be God. Come on, tell the truth. Many of us giving God layoff slips. Because we worry that he won't be able to do what he says he's going to do. How dare we say that to God? How dare we treat God as if God is not God, as if he needs our help, he needs our input, he needs our assistance. How dare we treat God like that? And here comes Jesus saying, I issue a new commandment. Do not worry. In fact, let me try this song. Some of us have, this week we've been looking at our sin list. And we've been making sure we didn't do this one, do that one, do this one, do that one. Y'all know we still go short because if we worry, we committed the sin because that's a commandment now. Do not worry. And the funny thing is, when we worry, we do what? We pray. And we pray to God about whatever we're going through. And we treat God like he doesn't know it. We treat God like he can't handle it. We treat God like he can't overcome it. And God says, you know what, when we act like that, we engage in needless prayer. Let me help someone, because someone still is not getting this. God says it's not getting it. I didn't say prayer was needless. I said we engage in needless prayer. And someone may be saying, you're splitting the difference. That's semantic. It's not semantic. When we say prayer is needless, we're saying prayer is ineffective. We're saying that the God we pray to does not listen to us, does not have the power to help us, does not have the power to overcome and bring us out of what we're going through. When we say prayer is needless, we're saying there is no purpose, rhyme, or reason for prayer, so why even engage in it? All right? Needless prayer is when we are coming to God to share with him something that he's already done. In fact, Jesus says, your, Lord, your Father, and who's in heaven, has knows that you have need of before you do. Which means, guess, guess what? By the time we realize it, we're behind eight ball. Y'all realize that? By the time we realize we're in trouble, by the time we realize that we have done something wrong, God is, all, God is already on you. We're the last ones to know. But yet we show up, be the first one here at church, be on our hands and knees at the altar. Oh, dear God, you just don't know what I'm dealing with. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm struggling with. And God, I need you right now. And God's sitting there looking at us like, look ahead, I knew that was coming before time started. Before you would ever thought of, I knew this problem was coming. And if I knew this problem was coming, that must have meant because I sent it to you. And that's a whole other sermon. We're going to talk about that on another Sunday. I don't want to overwhelm you today and tell you that God sent you trouble. In fact, we were talking about this in Bible study this morning, weren't we? I mean, Sunday school this morning, morning, weren't we? About the fiery furnaces and experiences that many of us don't want to get in the fiery furnace because we don't want to get in there and be burned. We want to avoid the fiery furnace because it's painful, because it's hot. 
because it's uncomfortable, because it exposes us to a risk of death. But here's the thing. Many times God can't get the glory he wants to get unless we get into the fiery furnace. That God has to do some things in us and with us and through us, and it only reaches its perfect revelation in the fiery furnace. But let me leave that alone. That's too much today for us to both say that God wants you in the fiery furnace and that God doesn't want us to do the English prayer. I just got here. I don't want people to restart the pastoral search committee to find a new pastor because he has just taken us in places we don't want to go, all right? Amen. Praise God. Come on now. Come on now. I'll be the last one to know I'm not the pastor anymore. I'll show up here. Amen. I'll show up here. The keys won't work. And, and then there'll be another person coming and talking about, hello there. I'm, I'm Pastor such a thing. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Prayer, prayer that we engage in where our Father in who's in heaven is already aware and already dealing with it. As you know from the title of our prayer, it's exposing the root causes of needless prayer. That's not to say we don't we don't pray, pray. That's not to say prayer is not necessary. We're just saying that there's a certain type of prayer that God is really saying that we don't have to engage in anymore. And that's needless prayer. In fact, our first point this morning is that needless prayer demonstrates that we lack faith. Amen. All right. Amen. Needless prayer demonstrates that we lack faith. Yeah. That we don't trust God. That we have to remind the author and finisher of our faith that one, we're going through something. Two, that we need his help. And three, that he's the only one that can handle it. Like he needs us to remind him that we that he, only, he can bring us through some things. But guess what? We do it all the time. Every time you get down and you say the same prayer over and over, dear Father, God, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to, to bug you or to, 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 to bother you, but check it out. Yeah, I know you're busy and I know you're answering 8 billion other prayers, but please don't forget that I need you to show up two years from now at employee review so that I can keep my job in two years. And we pray this for 365 days a year for two years. That's 730 days. The same prayer. Amen. It's an indication that we don't trust him. In fact, let me say this. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I have, I am a parent, more specifically, I'm a father. Amen. I share with you, I have three children. I'm a 15-year-old, a 5-year-old, and I have a 13-month-old. Now, the 13-month-old is going to be able to pass with this because he really can't talk. Now, now, he does let me know that he's in the house. He'll say, Daddy, and just start talking that baby gibberish. But praise God, he doesn't really do this yet. But my 15-year-old and my 5-year-old do this to me all the time. If I make a promise to them, mm -hmm. they are going to remind me every day that I made that promise. Mm -hmm. In fact, come on, parents. You know the worst thing you can do to a child is promise them anything. In fact, my parents used to not tell us anything, not promise. We used to think they were the dumbest people in the world. When are we going here? I don't know. <laughs> when are we get there? Where are we going to stay? I don't know. They learned not to promise us anything because we were going to remind them. My children the same, the same way. You, I cannot and Nicole cannot promise them anything without them reminding us of They can't remember to do homework. They can't remember to do their chores. They can't remember to brush their teeth before they go to bed. They can't remember to take a bath before they can go to bed. But they know that we're going such and such a place and we're going to do such and such a thing and they will remind us of it. In fact, let me make you laugh. Uh, in our house, we have what we call Daddy Spa, all right? I do my little girl's hands and toes, all right? And I think I do a good job. I think that, that if I open up my own nail shop, I will give polish and a couple other nail places a run for the money. You don't believe me? Look at my baby's hand. Now, let me give a pat back. It's been nine days since I painted her nails, so there's going to be a little chipping on them. But check me out next Sunday morning, because I have them looking really good. And I promised her uh, last week uh, that I was going to paint her nails on Monday night. I said, when Daddy gets home from, from church, I'm going to paint your nails. Uh, amen. But, uh, and, and here's the thing. We had a board of directors meeting. So we didn't leave out of there until almost 9 o'clock. And so when I got home, someone is in the bed waiting for me saying, Daddy, you want to paint nails? I said, not tonight, baby. We're going to do it. But you got to go to bed because you got to go to school. We'll do it tomorrow night. 
First thing when she wake up, not good morning, daddy. I'm so glad to see you, love you. Daddy, you want to do nails tonight? I said, yeah, we're going to do nails tonight. And something came up on Tuesday night where I didn't get home late because I was here at the church on Tuesday. And so we couldn't do it Tuesday. So we got up Wednesday. Daddy, you want to do nails tonight? Yeah, we're going to do nails tonight. And so when I got home Wednesday night, it was late. And, and she was in the bed. And this is what she said to me. But you're not going to, you're not going to paint my nails. You're not going to do it because you haven't done it all week long. And so Thursday morning, God, day before she asked me, this is what we're going to do. I'll make a promise to you. Daddy will paint your nails Friday night, tomorrow night. I won't be able to do them. So I know I won't be back in time. So I'll do them uh, to Friday night. I promise you I'll do them. And sure enough, several people called me and said, what are you doing Friday night? I want to do this. I want to do that. Even my oldest child said, I want to go to the game. I said, well, I can't take you, baby. I said, I promise your sister that I am going to paint her nails, and I refuse to let anyone or anything come between her and I on painting those nails. And, and sure enough, she reminded me, as soon as I picked her up in daycare Friday, we paint nails tonight. Now, here's the thing. Let me say this to all of us, because I know we do God like this, and we do one another like this. And we may not be little five-year-old kids wanting our nails polished, but we treat God and people like this all the time. We think we are doing them a favor if we remind them constantly that we promise to do something for them, or they promise to do something for us. In fact, Dick and John, I'm going to mess with her right, right quick. Amen. Praise God, because she's my friend. This is my buddy. But Dick and John promised me that she was going to give me some information for our next board of directors meeting. Now, it hasn't been a week since the last meeting, but if I'm constantly on you, hey, Dick and John, how you doing? Did you get the information? No, not yet, Pastor. And then I call her. She's like, hey, Pastor, how you doing? Did you get the information yet? No, not yet. We think we are doing someone a favor by constantly reminding them that they have to do something for us. You know what we're doing? We are wearing the ish out of them. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Yeah, see, Deacon Kinsley will teach you. Deacon Kinsley about to get this pastor in search for me. I don't know. See, I use another word. But see, you knew what I was saying. You knew what I was saying. Come on. Come on. Tell the truth. Let's be for real. Some of us come on this stage five minutes. And so when we're about to hear, we're using that language in Amen. Amen. We think we are helping someone. When we constantly remind them that they are obligated to do something for us, you know what you're doing? You're wearing them out. You're making them to the point that they don't want to see you or hear you. You don't wonder why people see you and they turn around and go that way. And you're like, hey, wait a second. Johnny, hold on, Johnny. Come on, run from me. And Johnny is running like he's on the Olympic track team and he's on the floor of the meter relay. Because we are wearing people out. Imagine how God feels. God here is trying to develop us and grow us into disciples and stewards and bring them glory. He's trying to give us blessings. He's trying to give us skills. He's trying to anoint us. And the only thing we can think about, but well, God, are you going to deal with my neighbor across the street? <laughs> he keeps letting his dog go to the bathroom in my yard. Now you keep telling him, stop letting your dog go to the bathroom in my yard. I don't want dog boo-boo in my yard. And God's like, well, listen, I'm trying to get you to love that neighbor. I'm trying to get you to invite that neighbor to church. And you're worried about what the dog is doing. In fact, that's my dog. I sent him over there so you have a reason to go next door and talk to your neighbor. <laughs> We're worrying, God, with the constant prayers. We don't pray to God, God, make me a better disciple. Make me a better steward. Make me a better uh, uh, prayer warrior. No, God, did you do this? Needless prayers. Because check it out. One, he knows it. Two, he's already on it. And three, believe it or not, he's already worked that thing out. Amen. Amen. So our first point this morning is, needless prayers demonstrate a lack of faith. Yeah. Try this out. Here's the second point that Jesus said in his sermon about worrying. He said, needless prayers are what unbelievers do. Notice what he says in the scripture, all right? I'm, make, I'm making a connection between worrying and praying, all right? He says, worrying is what, worrying is what dominates the minds of those who do not believe. Unbelievers, persons that are not connected to God through a saving relationship, a sanctifying relationship, that these persons worry because these persons do not know and do not have God on their side, so they do not have 
have a stamp of, ins of assurance. They do not have proof of, of, of provision or protection that we have. And so they worry. But Jesus said those who are in God, those who belong to God, do not worry. In fact, a couple weeks ago, we talked about last week, a couple weeks ago in Bible study, we were in Revelation, and the question that our teacher asked us is, when the day of judgment comes, what does that mean for the Christian? Should the Christian be scared? Should the Christian be worried? And we went around, and, 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 and Dr. Hammett would let me answer the question, because being a, a minister and studying that word, I knew where she was going. So we went around, everyone telling what they were worried about. And she said, all right, your turn, uh, Pastor. What would, what would, well, how do you feel? I said, I'm not worried at all. Because guess what? I have accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. That I live for him. That I serve him. And if necessary, I would die for him. That when the day of judgment comes, why would I be worried about anything? I'm marked with the seal. With the blood. I, the only people that should be worried on that time are the non-believers. They're not connected. So here's the thing. If that is where God wants us to be, why are we worrying? And why are we praying out of worry? In fact, Jesus gives two concretizations of why we should not worry. The first one is the birds of the air. And the funny thing, this week, all I've been seeing are these eagles and falcons and vultures. Uh, amen. It's getting cold and the animals are running down the street. They're getting hit. And these animals are, 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 are taking advantage of the carrion just laying around, the, the, the dying flesh laying around. And so they're picking it and getting their food from it. And I was watching those birds. And at one point, I looked up in the sky, and there were several circling, and I couldn't tell what they were. They were so far away, they all looked the same. Now, when, what happened, I had to stop. Because they stopped like and they came down. Because any time the traffic stopped flowing, they come down to get me. And then I realized there were vultures, there were hawk, hawks, and there were eagles, all eating from the same thing. And I said, ain't that interesting? They did not get up this morning and say, what am I going to eat today? How am I going to find something to eat? Well, where am I going to find it? When, I mean, and when I find it, how am I going to break it open so I can get, get it? And, and if I've got babies, how am I going to take this back to the baby? They didn't worry about that. If I try it on, it's been so cold lately. I mean cold, and I got to agree with my wife. It's cold. I'm hot nature. I like it cold. But it's been too cold for me. You don't see any of these birds knocking on anyone's door talking about, hey, I usually don't do this, but I need a place to stay tonight. Uh, you don't mind if I live in your garage for tonight, or I live upstairs in the attic where it gets some heat. No, the birds don't worry about a thing. And here it is, Jesus says, Aren't you more valuable to your heavenly father than some birds? Yes. He said, they neither told nor did they work, yet they are fed every day. He, here's another conversation he gave. The lilies of the field. <coughs> These pretty flowers, they're wildflowers, but they're real pretty. Have you ever seen a lily? I mean, the, the, the florists sell lilies, but they don't compare to the bigger ones that are growing in the, in the field. And, and Jesus says, at no time did they worry about their beauty or how they would be clothed. In fact, he says, even Solomon, with all his wisdom, divine wisdom that God has given him, did not compare to the beauty of the lily in the field. And he says, aren't you more valuable to your father than a lily? In fact, he tags that with, why do you have such little faith? you got to say, worry and needless prayer and say it's little faith. And what happens, it says to us, not only that we don't trust God to be able to handle it, that we believe that we live in a place of finiteness. That, amen, the bird is trying to get in here to get some sermon right now. He's beating on the window. Amen, praise God. That we live at a time where there's only ten or whatever, a hundred or whatever, a thousand or whatever. And if we don't get into it quickly, someone's going to get it from us. In fact, the, these retail stores play on, on, on our fears like that. In fact, you know what they do? And I, I, the other day I was shopping for something. They said, we only have one. We can't find it. It's somewhere in the store. I said, well, I live by this store there. They said, they only have two, but I don't know if you're going to find it. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, well, you know, you don't want me to buy and spend my money in this store. And the man said, huh? I said, why would I come back to your store if you're going to tell me you only have one or something you don't know where that one thing is? You don't want me to buy anything. Amen. Come on, tell the truth, someone. So here's the thing. I'm walking out, and you know how you, you remember, so I said, I need to grab something. And I look down, 
And right where it, it was supposed to be that it totally wouldn't be was the very thing that the man said you're not going to be able to find. So now, I was on the phone with someone. Someone said, you better not go back over there and tell him where to find this. So I said, I sure do am. If he's going to sell something, I'm going to go back and say, sir, come here a second. What's this right here? He said, that's what you're looking for. I said, you had it. And so here comes another guy in the back. He said, uh, he didn't know I was there. He said, hey, dude, we need to make room. We got a whole stock of them sitting back in the back. Wait a second. You got a whole stack of these in the back? And you are intentionally putting on your thing, on your counter one, they're trying to make me and someone else fight over it. Because if we know it's an abundance, we won't be able to get it. But if it's one, and you don't believe me, look, look at Black Friday. Folks, I have my palm full over some TVs that aren't really cheaper than they really did any other time. Walmart sells stuff cheap every day. Changes it by $10, and we out there fighting over TVs, PlayStation, Game Boys. Because we think the supply is finite. And you know what happens? Folks are sitting in their office watching the video like, look at it, look at my ass. Come on, man. We, and when we worry, we act from a place of something that's finite. And because it's finite, we have to get it. And if we can't get it, we start stressing because we know that we need it. And if we don't have it, we won't be able to function. God is all you need. Amen. All day, every day. Amen. I don't care if they ain't got the new Eric Jordan. I know my English teachers are here. I'm like, oh, Lord, he's splitting and using bad verbs. He ain't the wrong improper tense. Ain't got Jordan ain't got the iPhone, ain't got the, the, the Samsung Galaxy Note tuck slide on the side, on the top, whatever it is. Don't worry if they don't have it. Because that's not what you need. Amen. What you need is God. Amen. And God is saying, stop tripping, stop worrying, stop burning up my phone lines with these prayers that really mean nothing because I've already dealt with it, I've already got it. So, now, Having said that, where does that lead us? If God is telling us we don't need to engage in needless prayer, where does that lead us? It leads us in a place where we have something we need to do. Now, the New Living Translation says, you know, you know, pursue God and, and live righteously. But the King James says, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to. Okay. So our duty as Christians, as disciples, as stewards, is to be pursuing God. All right, that's our third point. That our requirement, instead of worry, instead of engaging in needless prayer, is to be pursuing God. All right. In fact, let me let me make you laugh. And he's not here, and I was hoping he's here, uh, uh, Brother Rose. Amen. Y'all know who y'all know. He got the silver hair, and he and when he talks, he says, "I ain't playing about this." And he tags everything with, "I ain't playing about this." Y'all know who I'm talking about it. Hallelujah! And whatnot. I mean, you, you, you can't miss Brother Rose. Brother Rose comes to, to Bible study every week. And he and I actually enjoy Brother Rose being there because there's certain things he reminds us of. He reminds us that we can do nothing of our own. That everything that we are is because of God. I mean, it doesn't matter what the topic would be. The topic would be on uh, uh, multiplying low bread, loaves of bread and fish. We can't do nothing without God. The topic could be about raising Lazarus from death. We can't do nothing without God. The topic could be about Gehazi and him taking some of the some of the uh, the booty or the or the, or the treasure. But we can't do nothing with God. That's his input. The second thing that he likes to tell to tell us all the time is that our focus, our purpose of being here is not just so that we can be blessed, but so that we can be a blessing to someone else. He shares with us all the time how God uses him to go to different places and be blessed to people that many times he said he'll tell you he doesn't even know how he's going to address it, but God would already have prepared the ground so that when he gets there, whatever he needs to say, the person said, that's what I've been praying for anyway. I've experienced that happening with him in our conversation. It happens with me too, but the one thing that he wants us to know above all other things, and he ain't playing about this when he says it, okay, is that our duty our primary purpose is to seek God, to pursue God. Now, here's a funny thing. Notice when Jesus says it, he never, never says that we will actually one day, uh, on this side of the Jordan, get the kingdom of God. He says, seek. Every day, you're, 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 
We won't find the kingdom of God until we're in heaven, all right? But that doesn't mean you don't see it on this side. Because guess what? Every day presents a new opportunity to serve God. Every day presents a new opportunity to witness to someone about God. Every day presents a new opportunity for us to literally stand up and stand in the gap and represent God. Amen. Not only that, it's an opportunity for us to demonstrate righteousness. Yes. Yes. Let me tell you, I told y'all, I got problems when I drive. Uh, I don't like y'all when I drive. Because some of y'all don't know how to drive. I mean, it's a yield sign, not a stop sign. And then a stop sign is not a yield sign. I can't understand how people get to the stop sign and then want to cheat it like a yield sign. And this woman almost ran me into a pole one day as I was going to Walmart. I mean, she was turning right. She didn't even stop. I had a green light. I know she had a red light. Didn't even stop. Just yielded that stop and almost ran me into a traffic pole. And then there are times when here it is, I'm trying to get to church, come to Bible study, and I need to get something from Walmart, and I'm trying to get out the parking lot or out the light that comes out the parking lot, and it's green, and somebody's sitting in front of me, and they're just sitting there. <laughs> I don't want to be mean. I don't want to be unchrist like Jesus Christ, it's been 30 seconds. This is a minute long. Come on now. And then when I finally blow at the 50 second mark, and then pull off, and then the light turns red, and I'm stuck here in the light. I bet, yeah, for those of, those of us who are traveling some of these roads, y'all do know that the, the multiple lanes are not there for all of us to go slow in all lanes, right? The right lane is for us to go slow. Who cares? Sister Care about that. Nah, hey, man, you know what I'm talking about. The right lane is to go slow. The middle lane is to pass. The far left lane is to go extremely fast. Okay? <laughs> this far left lane is not for you to get there and do 20 miles below. Hey, man, someone know what I'm talking about. Hey, man. 20 miles below the speed limit. And it never fails when I am running late. Here comes Grandma. <laughs> And here's the mess up thing. You, you're trying to get over, and then someone's, because they, they're going so they come out from behind, so you stop. And I'm in that zone. I tell you, I tell you, I had to, if it wasn't for the cross, I'd be in trouble. Amen. God has to keep me under the cross. You know what I mean? I mean, I can, amen, I understand why uh, the, the offerings, you had to keep doing the offerings back in the day, that you could bring your offering to the temple or the synagogue, but as soon as you left, you needed to bring another one, because someone had done something stupid to you. I mean, I, 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 I just don't understand that, and with people driving, but here's the thing, God causes me, or requires me, to pursue righteousness, to live righteousness. Which means I can't say you summon a summon a summon a summon a summon Y'all know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Come on now. So I act like you don't know what I'm saying here. But I can't say bless you in the name of Jesus. Well, I'm praying that God will teach you how to drive. So that next time at the stoplight, you are sitting here where you can really go. I, I, that, it, 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 that's righteousness, isn't it? Bless you. I'm praying for you. Bless you. I'm, in, in fact, you know what? Here, here's a funny thing. Uh, I went this week. I went to visit the second shut-in, and uh, on our list, and, and um, everywhere I went, besides the second shut-in, I couldn't get in the hospital or out of the hospital because someone wanted to talk to me. And I said to myself, "My God, Bible study was starting late today, but we're in the parking lot just trying to talk." And then I realized what it is. I told God that I was available for His righteousness. You know, for to do the things that he wants me to do, to be available. And what was happening, persons couldn't find a chaplain, a hospital chaplain. And it wasn't like I was wearing a badge that said Pastor Al. It's just that I said I am available to be used. And what happened, God allowed them to spiritually discern who I was. And here's a mess up thing. There was one guy, he's from South Carolina, he's nice and wanted to be. Greg, he made you look like look like a five-year-old kid. I mean, he was so big. I just knew he played for the Panthers. And I thought he was telling me, not telling me the truth. That he played, and when he shook my hand, it was almost like a big beer, a palm shaking my hand. And when he hugged me, I kind of disappeared in the, in, the, in, in the pose and whatnot. And, and, and but he was, we were talking, he said, man, I'm so happy to be able to talk to you. Because I just feel like I need to get this on my chest. He would tell me his praise report. And what, but that's the righteousness of God. 
because it gave him a chance to share his story. Now, what if I had been in a situation where I was down and I needed the, needed some, the word of God that day? And here it is, the man of God needs the word of God, but yet I'm not pursuing the kingdom and not seeking his righteousness. I would have missed that. You know, we can be so busy, we just walk on by. Hey, man, let me talk to you. Hey, man, can I get you some coffee? Hey, man, let me, just, let me just walk with you. We are supposed to be pursuing the kingdom of God. And that means loving folks when they don't want to be loved. That means helping folks when they don't want to be helped. That means coming up with a solution when someone says that there is no way of going forward. And the last thing we need to do is engage in needless prayer. We need to be using these opportunities to be able to be a blessing to someone. So this week, and I'm finished, this week, as we are moving forward, this is what we're doing. We're not going to engage in needless prayer. That when we pray, we're not going to waste God's time praying about something we don't pray about for the last 10 years. If God's going to send you a man or a woman, they are coming. Stop stressing God out. God is trying to get them ready for you. God is trying to put them in a place where you, when you meet them, they're exactly what you need. Leave God alone and stop, stop focusing on what God wants you to have. If God has told you to bless the kids in the neighborhood, get your Buddha Buddha out there and start talking right. and working with these right. kids. Start, start walking with them. Stop sharing with them. Stop trying to be perfect all the time and make them think that you never went through something. Tell them that you had some time and you couldn't understand algebra either or geometry or trigonometry either. Tell them that you spirits growing up, parents who didn't understand, parents who wouldn't listen either. Tell them that you were tempted just like they were to engage in some of the same foolishness that they are tempted to engage in. Come down to their level for a change and if you're going to pray about something, pray about making yourself available to be used. Stop worrying about whether or not God's going to heal your body. If God gave you the breath to breathe, the warmth of blood through your body and the strength to get up and move yourself around, if he gave you the strength and the ability to be a blessing to someone who cannot move, someone who cannot live. Yeah, I know your rheumatism is acting up. I know your arthritis is not cooperating. I know that the sugar is high, the pressure is high, uh, and all that is keeping you uh, in feeling a certain way, but you still have the ability to get in your car and drive across town to Miss Johnson's house and say to Miss Johnson, Miss Johnson, I know you have a doctor's appointment today, and I know you don't have a ride, so Miss Johnson, me and you are going to the doctor. I don't have to be back there in the room with you. I'm going to make sure you get there and you get back. Stop tripping and worrying about what's going to happen at the job. Instead, you know you got co-workers that come in frowning every day, come in uh, upset and down every day. What harm is it if you walk up to that desk and say, hey, I'm going to get a cup of coffee. Would you like some? Or I'm going on break for the next 15 minutes. I noticed you haven't have been on break yet. Would you please come join me? Or when you're in the break room and you're sitting there eating and you're on one side of the table, they're on one side of the table. Stop waiting for them to come to your side of the table. You go down to there and say, I hope you don't mind, but I thought I would sit with you today and be interact with you. What is your name and where you're from and what you're doing and what you're going through? And you'll be surprised that people will respond to you because many people get up each morning and say, God, if you would just let someone show me that they care about me, then I know that you care about me too. And here it is, you're sitting there talking about, I got a migraine, my husband stressing me out right now. He, won't, he can't pick up the kids and I, I got to figure out who's going to pick up the kids. Worry about that afterward. You are there on the job. Be present on the job. Be a present help. Do that. And watch the kingdom of God start to be revealed to you. It says, will all the other things be added to you? Watch the kingdom of God be revealed to you. Amen. Amen. We're done. Amen.